Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Friday. And I got a guest for you. We're going to have some fun. And yes, we're going to talk about a place where everybody knows your name. Let's do this. Shut up and sit down. The Business Bros Podcast was created for you. Learn from the business professionals who come to share their stories. Find out what's working in business on social media, what's hot and what's not, straight from the mouths of successful entrepreneurs out there doing the real work. And now, welcome to another episode of Business Bros. All right, ladies and gents, uh, let me give you a little bit of, a, of an intro here for our guest today. Uh, oh, as always, we do a little bit of a fire intro. All right, so our guest today has quite a unique story. At 13, he made a short movie with the cast of Cheers. Yeah, that Cheers. Uh, from there, things just kept getting better. He worked for he worked on the movie lots and then started working with DVA Inc. and quickly learned the ropes and improving his operational skills and sales skills. He developed relationships with major studios, labels, publishers, servicing over 350 retail uh, 350 retail accounts and over 20,000 storefronts like Best Buy. Sears, Kmart, Target, and more. Now, I'm excited to talk about our guest story today. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Ryan Golger. All right, Ryan, if you haven't noticed, I love to have fun on the show, man. It's just I love it. I love it. Love the energy. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, man, let's, let's jump into this. Uh, 13 years old, I remember being young and watching things like the Animaniacs and to watch them go on to the movie lots and see actors and kind of communicate with people that, uh, you know, you look up to on TV. It's a dream, right? You lived it. Tell me a little I, bit about I that. Did, I, I never was, I never compared it. And I love that show, the Animaniacs. And I never thought of it. Maybe I liked it because yes, I used to, go on to the studio lot, Warner Brothers and so forth. And, uh, but I didn't live there like Danny Maniacs did. And I didn't get chased out by the security all the time. Only once. (laughs) (laughs) Only once? You got chased out? I I technically had an issue once, yes. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you stumble on Cheers? And and what was it like stumbling on that type of lot or, or interacting with people that you may have seen on TV and all of a sudden they're there in real life? You know, it was so basically my parents bought a new house and it was right in the heart of L.A., like Hollywood and all the movie studios were around and they moved in right at summertime. And I basically had a summer of doing nothing. And I went, well, you know what, I'm going to get on my bike and I'm going to start riding to all these movie studios because I wanted to be a director and make movies. And I thought, why don't I just go check it out and just learn and experience it and see it and watch it and see if I can get a job? Well, at 13, you really can't get a job because it's illegal even back then. So I basically started riding around to each studio, whether it be Paramount, 20th Century Fox, et cetera, and went to each one and would just sit and watch them make a movie. And yes, met all of these stars from Bruce Willis to Billy Crystal, a lot of 80s people. And uh, and then I stumbled on the cheer set because I would just go from soundstage to soundstage, which is where they'd film the TV show or, or movie and, you know, where Michael J. Fox was filming, filming Family Ties or Ted Danson was filming Cheers. And then basically was introduced to Ted and Ted said, who are you and what are you doing? And I said, hey, I want to make a movie. And he said, great. How about we do this? You can use any of the actors here and you write a script and we'll make the movie one day on our lunch break. And I went, oh, my God, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And at the time, for any listeners, the Cheers show was the number one show at the time. This was in 1987. So this is like I didn't even know how much of an opportunity this was and didn't take advantage of it. But that's really what happened. And it was amazing. All right. So mainstream top show actors said, yeah, I'll do a little short film with you. Uh, did you let that opportunity slip or what happened? No, did you I, I, made, happen? I made the short. It was Woody Harrelson, Ted Danson, Kirstie Alley, and George Went. Um, I think Woody Harrelson is the most famous in today's times, um, does a lot of interesting movies, um, and Ted Danson and Kirstie Alley, of course. And I basically made a short, and it was two minutes and 20 seconds long, and it was called The Question. And I recently took it out of my you know, filing cabinet and edit it. And I'm going to publish it soon. I'm not allowed to sell it. I'm not because I don't I didn't pay the actors because it was all free. But yes, I will be presenting it in the next year or so and showing the world. And if it does great, it does great. If not, it was just a it was a fun little thing to do. 
He experiences everything, though. I mean, you, you know, we live in, in interesting times right now where people are so afraid to do so many different things. Uh, hey, we're, well. being, we're being locked away in our rooms, and we're forgetting the human connection and the interaction and the memories are really what life's all about. Mm-hmm. The experiences open doors to new things. What, what did it open the door for you to do? I mean, what, did, what ended up happening? You know, ironically, it opened the door to not wanting being a film director. (laughs) (laughs) So I didn't pursue that. I mean, I was into it and it was fun, but it took a lot of work, just like anything does in today's times and even back then. I mean, from when I wrote the script that Ted Danson told me to wrote and did rewrites and sent him new stuff to the time we actually filmed it, it was literally like nine months and I had to keep like, you know, being persistent and following up and saying, can we do it on this day? Can we do it on this day? And then finally in February... You know, and I think I met him in August. He finally, you know, we got the approval to do it. So we did it and it was great and it was fun and I loved it. And, you know, and it it was it was really a a gas to do. And then just after that, you know, then I just kind of went back into school and kind of did other things. And it just, you know, as a 13 year old, it just kind of was like, okay, that's done next. So but I did love, you know, doing it. And would I do it again? Yes. But at the same time, I then, you know, I was in the heart of high school. So you kind of get I kind of got involved in that. And then my parents moved and then I went to a different school. So everything just kind of changed anyway on its own. So you, you got an experience that was awesome. You never quite left the industry though, right? Like, like once you got bit by that bug, okay, maybe you weren't going to be the director sitting in that chair. Right. But you, you obviously got bit by some sort of bug in that industry. What, what, what did you end up doing? Well, in the movie industry, you know, everyone wants to go be an actor, a writer, a director, or something, because there is a certain harmonic, there's a certain energy that comes from it. It is really cool. It's really fun to be on a set or a set, you know, a studio lot and be around people and the free food and, you know, everyone's moving around and they do the take and then they take a break. It's really cool. But yes, basically what I learned is, you know, I got into the video industry, which is, I should say, the business side of the movie industry, because at the time when I started, when I was done with school a few years later, I started working for a video distributor, which would distribute VHS tapes, if anyone knows what those are, videos or movies to video rental stores before everyone just turned on their TV and watched a movie that way. So I was working with the home video departments, yes, which is more of the business side. And I really enjoyed that. And I continued that and still do work with the studios. And it was like, okay, great. So I'm not on a set every day making a movie saying cut, whatever, but I'm dealing with the business side of working with the studios and helping them move large quantities of their movies to video rental stores or Best Buy or Circuit City at the time or Target at the time and just filling that spot. Yeah, I heard it said uh, it's called show business, right? Everybody's fascinated with the show, not as many people with the business aspect of it. So you ended up uh, learning a lot of stuff. Tell me a little bit about DVA Inc. and how you got involved. I mean, you're not a founder, but you're still quite up there, right? You know, I, so basically, you know, what I, you, you asked the question earlier, what did I learn from the experience or what did I gain from it? You know, I learned to be persistent. I learned to be communicative. You know, that's how I got the thing with Ted Danson and the Cheers people. I communicated. I, I went out. I had a certain charisma. I, I would talk and I would meet people. When I'd go to these studio lots, you know, and go sit on a set, you know, I met all these people from Bruce Willis to Eddie Murphy because I would just go, hey, I'm Ryan. What are you doing? Hey, can I help out? You know, and I was like that. So in the business that I got into, DBA, to come back to that, to circle back, that right when I was done with high school, my father owned a business that distributed videos to video stores. And basically, I got into that business as a family member. And I was just, you know, worked in the warehouse, then worked my way up to like cold calling, if people know what that is, to then doing sales. And basically, I kind of grew from there. And I'm the one who actually started the whole reach or the world of working with the movie studios and selling it to video stores, or should I say to bigger big box chains like Best Buy and Sears at the time and Target and so forth. So I kind of, yes, I wrote on the family coattails, but they basically gave, my father gave me a job, which I appreciate and love. And from there I learned and escalated and basically just made new divisions and new income sources, new revenue for the company and grew it from there. Let's talk about the passing out, you know, getting the distribution part of the business because that's vitally important. Like, you know, today we take distribution for granted because distribution is so commoditized. It's so easy to get our information out there. Uh, well, 
at least to host it, right? Uh, we still have other things that you learn. What, what are some things in the distribution space that you've learned that uh, we could probably use today, even though we're not paying, you know, we're not recording on VHS, everything's digital, but some of those fundamentals might still hold true. Well, you know, the, my business, my world of DVA, which was, stands for distribution video and audio because we distributed video and audio, which video actually means VHS today and audio really means like CD, which both formats aren't used as much anymore. Um, I basically became a, we, I turned the company into a distributor. We actually would buy excess inventory and closeouts of everything. So we went from just one product line, one vertical to everything, and then basically expanded it even more. And I now work for a company called Plan B, which I own. The word DVA, that company is now gone um, and not really needed. The name didn't work. And now it's called Plan B. So basically, I learned through distribution how to buy and sell things. That's really what it is. I mean, a distributor, a wholesaler really is buying something at one price, low, and then reselling it for a higher price with a margin in between. So I learned this through that business and learned that, wait a second, you can distribute, if you're distributing one product, one widget, whether it be a DVD or a VHS, let's call it a movie or a music CD, you, you can apply the same principle to buying and selling anything, actually, whether it's it, whether it's all the stuff behind you, which, by the way, that's cool, all the hats and all that stuff, to anything on your desk from, you know, keyboards to mouses to cell phones to speakers to clocks. So when you when you talk about, you know, the distribution part, I think, is, is where we get mixed up, because when I'm hearing it today, it's like I own an Etsy store. I need to sell some stuff. Right. Or I'm not a manufacturer. I don't know how to create product A, but I would love to be a part of that particular product. Uh, wholesaling is always a scary word for somebody who's going to get into a game at the very beginning until they start learning the process and realize what wholesaling actually is. I mean, you can see it in the real estate space. You can see it in small products as well. Uh, help me narrow down what the wholesaling process looks like when you go looking for people that are going to get rid of products in bulk, like you're talking about closeout sales. What does that actually mean that you're, you're doing a closeout sale that you're picking up a particular product? What are you looking for? Good question. So that's actually why I wanted to be on this podcast is to help your listeners learn how to do this business and not specifically the business of buying and selling, but any business. So whether they open up a flower shop or whether they're on Etsy selling their own product, for example, Etsy, since you brought that up first, that is someone who made their own product or making their own product and then put it online and they sell it one, two, three, ten at a time, 50 at a time, whatever. That's great. Now to go on to how do you how do you turn that into bulk? Because distribution and wholesale really means bulk. That means you're taking one product and you're multiplying it, meaning you're making thousands of it or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of it and then reselling it. So anytime you have an idea for a product that you're looking to do to answer your question is, well, first, you have to come up with manufacturing. So you have to get the product manufactured in bulk and you have to find a manufacturer. Depending upon the product you want to manufacture, there are many sources to do that. A lot of people go to Asia to do it to save price, to save costs. Or if it's something simple that doesn't have to do with electronics, you can do it here in America, which we all love when things are made here in America because it helps jobs. So you find a whole, you find a manufacturer who will make it. You find out how many they can make for you and what the price is. You narrow it down. Then you have to go through a quality control and make sure the product is you know, correct. And that's what you want. So there's some tweaking and that's going to take some time. And you just got to have patience and a lot of tolerance to go through that period or that process. And then once you actually get the product, now you have to go sell it. So you have to find someone who wants to buy it. Whether you're going to list it on Amazon, there's a lot of Amazon resellers right now. So you can list it on Amazon. You can go to a retail store, meaning you can go to a mom and pop, a boutique store that's like in a little tourist town and they can put it in their store and order two or three at a time. Or you can do it in bulk and sell it to Best Buy or Dollar General or Target or Walmart or Amazon. Any of those avenues are great. But my biggest advice is you have to have a lot of patience because business is hard these days. And I don't mean that to deter you, but I mean to say that you have to fill out a lot of paperwork. You have to show proof of how it's manufactured and testing reports and all that. I own another business actually where we manufacture in China. So I'm kind of used to this, but even when I'm distributing a product that's already manufactured, meaning I didn't manufacture it, the people I sell to the retailers still want to see how was it manufactured? Because, you know, if they sell a product that's defective, defunct, et cetera, they could be sued. Everyone's liable. Mm. Yes. Like I know when you're talking about that stuff, cause I've never done bulk sales myself personally. Um, it sounds very overwhelming. Like to me, if I was ever going to jump into something like that, 
I would want to find a mentor, somebody who's already doing that in that space. And and as you're describing that, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, that's the value in Shark Tank, right? Like when you go to yeah. these to these, uh, well, they're essentially venture capitalists. But when you're going on a show like Shark Tank, it's not a hundred percent for the money. The money's great when you get an investor to come in. You're looking for somebody with the expertise that you're talking about, who's already in this space, who has those connections, who knows about the paperwork and the red tape that you got to go through. Um, did you mentor with somebody or was it like 100% trial and error, figure it out as you go? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say it was trial and error. Figure out, I mean, I had support. I mean, anytime you're going to create a new product or bring a product to market or manufacture and distribute a product, you have a team. You have people there who help you, whether it's the manufacturer or your sales team or the retailer you're selling to. But yes, I did primarily learn on my own, my own, but we, you know, I have employees here that help with it. So I say, hey, let's do this. And one of them researches this and one of them researches how to market it. But I will say that like, yes, it, it can be a little agonizing, but you have to you have to motivate yourself because entrepreneurs are magnificent people. They're, they're built with a certain chip where they know how to motivate themselves, stay on track. And no matter what the issue is, like I said earlier, have the patience and tolerance to go through with it, which, you know, your listeners. So, you know, some people are going to be like, hey, I can do it. And they're going to persevere and they're going to do it. Any person who's a multi-billionaire from Bill Gates to Jeff Bezos to whomever, Elon, they've all gone through the same problems that we're talking about right now on this podcast. They've all done it. They've just, you know, have the patience and tolerance to go through it and the wherewithal. And yes, have relationships. They might have a mentor. They might not. But go back to Shark Tank. Yes, those people. I watch that show and I love it because I see these products that are put out. And I'm like, that would do good. That would not. So, <laughs> so I'm always like a critic on the show and go, OK, yeah, I would buy that one. No, that's not going to do well. Or that one needs to go to Dollar General. That one needs to go to Lowe's. But the four or five sharks, as they call them, that are sitting there, their main wherewithal, obviously, second, you know, first is money. But second is their relationships. Yes, with a manufacturer. But most of these people that come on already have manufacturing, but their relationship isn't how to sell it, which goes back to your distribution. If you have it. So I have so many people that, that I know who come up with a great idea. And being that I'm in the closeout business, meaning I distribute people's mistakes, I see what's done well and what hasn't. And when people come to me and say, hey, I had this idea for this great product and I got 10,000 units or whatever. It's like, well, I could see where it didn't do well and where it didn't. And one of them is, you know, they didn't go to the right retailer. If you have a kitchen item and you go to Lowe's and try to sell it. It's not going to go well. Those sharks have relationships with the right market, the right verticals, the right distribution channels. Like, I, I don't know the names, but the woman has the channel with home shopping and QVC. So she knows that that market would be great for her. Or someone else might have a market like Damon John with retail, because again, he started selling his clothing in Gap and so forth. So each one has their own vertical, their own path that they take to sell it on. The times are changing, right? Like, yeah. no matter <laughs> what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you started in the VHS space. So, you know, if we have younger entrepreneurs, that's the, the big black cassette tape that you would put in a VCR. Uh, but you started in the VHS space. You've gone through the blockbuster bust. Uh, you've gone through the Netflix. And, and now we're entering into a world of, uh, you know, Web 3.0, the, the whole metaverse space. How are you seeing and how are you adapting as those types of things change in your in in your industry? Like all of a sudden the distribution models kind of shift or or are they fundamentally still staying where they are? So it is always changing. And one of the biggest hurdles I see is technology. Someone someone always asks me, hey, what's the biggest thing you see is technology. So the way we communicate um I mean, when I was selling VHS, there were two ways, three ways to, to sell it. You, you got on the phone and you made a call. You sent someone a letter or you sent someone a fax. Today, you have everything from cell phones to texting to social media to LinkedIn to emailing to phone calls to, to WhatsApp to everything. All these different processes and ways of communicating with someone and trying to sell your product. So I believe that, you know, in the world today, it is changing. And how do I stay up to date with it? First of all, I subscribe to tons of industry magazines. So whatever your listener is, whatever industry they're in, if they're making a little coffee cup on Etsy, there are, it's called housewares. So they need to become part of the housewares association and, and get trade magazines from that. And then they can stay up to date with what's going on because they're going to hear about retailers that, ooh, this retailer, Best Buy is actually going to start selling coffee cups. Oh, okay, good. Now I can go call Best Buy and try to get on their list and try to be, you know, a vendor to them and supply them. So 
you, you always have to stay up to date with what's going on in the industry by being part of associations and groups. And I don't mean Facebook groups, but I mean like groups, associations that already are pioneer in that industry and have a convention, by the way, that, you know, let's get rid of COVID, but have a convention once a year where people go to and they mingle and see other products and, and you have a chance to present your new product to retail or whatever distribution channel it is. You mentioned uh, Dollar General uh, over here in San Diego. We have a Dollar Tree uh, and uh, literally we love to go there to grab some candy. But if you walk through those dollar stores, there is a lot of different products. And I always walk through. I'm like, oh, that one didn't make it, huh? Oh, that one didn't make it, huh? And then, you know, but but some of them are really cool products, right? Yeah. So, you know, what happens to a product or what, what is, is the, the life cycle of a product that ends up in a Dollar Tree? Or is that a profitable way to go to actually end up there? Okay, so that's so threefold. That's a threefold question. And it's a very good question, by the way. So number one, Dollar Tree, about 75% of what they buy is actually manufactured for them. Okay, it's called private label. That's the word. OEM is another word used in this industry, which really means that, okay, people need rulers, they need staplers, they need pens, they need scotch tape. So Dollar Tree just goes and has it manufactured in their name, or they go buy a brand name like Scotch Tape, the little green you know tape reel that you see, and they get it at a cheaper price or Wrigley's gum. So you can Wrigley's gum is in there or bubble yum or whatever, because if you compare that pack of gum compared to the pack of gum you see at your local gas station or supermarket, it's less pieces of gum in there. So therefore they can sell it cheaper. So Dollar Tree doesn't always mean that it is a closeout. It just means it's a it's an item, a product sold at a lower quantity, which means a lower price to you. Number two, yes, there are some stuff you will see in Dollar Tree. I can walk around and I can pinpoint what's a closeout and what's a not. Usually it's something that's kind of at the edge or in the corner or an end cap, it's called, that's, that's a closeout. Now, why did the product not do well? Well, one man's trash is another man's gold. That's the motto of our business. So, um, so maybe whoever made that product sold it, like I said, to Best Buy, and it wasn't, Best Buy was the wrong vertical, was the wrong channel, so now it turned into a liquidation. But people that walk into a Dollar Tree and 99 cent only, that is the right market. That is the right people who would want that type of coffee cup, hypothetically. So, and now to, to add on, because I'm sure one of your questions is gonna be, how do you make sure your product isn't a closeout, which I think you've kind of asked. So whenever someone has a new idea for a product and they say, oh, I wanna make a coffee cup that has a clock on it. First of all, find out if anyone's done it before. What's your competition? Just Google it. Just coffee cup with clock on it. And you're going to see, are there people doing it? Are there too many people doing it? If there's too many people, I would not make that product because you have too much competition. If there's nobody doing it, then see how many people would buy it. Like, is there a market for that? Sometimes, sometimes some of your listeners are going to come up with, hey, I think we should really make a coffee cup with a clock on it. Who actually wants a coffee cup with a clock on it? It's electronic. Someone might think they're going to get electrocuted. Yes, that might be the thought. So you just have to research your product and find out who's already making it, how many people, and how many people would potentially buy it. And then who is your audience? Meaning, is it a Best Buy customer? Is it a grocery store customer? Is it a Walmart customer? And then you go after that market, that retailer, and sell the product. Oh, a little bit of market much, research. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I agree with you, but a little bit of market research goes a long way. And, and it's funny because I was literally having a conversation with somebody who has an idea for a business. Uh, and they get this mentality of, you know, I'm going to tell you, but don't tell anybody like, I, you know what I mean? Like this is, this is going to be, this is going to be what I want to do. And I want to share with anybody. And I literally had the same exact conversation. I'm like, no, you know, it doesn't matter how many people you tell 99% of the population, you can give them a step-by-step -step direction on how to do something. They're not going to do it. Yeah, and what you really... it. Or, or somebody's already done it or your phone is listening to the idea right now. <laughs> exactly. Some alien's going to get it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but what I encourage is you actually go and do that. Cause what you're describing is market research. Like you want to know if your idea is good. If you go and talk about your idea and nobody cares, um, it's probably the clock with the with the, you know, the 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 cup of the clock on it, right? It's probably not the idea that you want to go with. And we're going through a time right now through the great resignation. So many people are leaving their corporate jobs and they're jumping into an entrepreneur space. Never been entrepreneurs before, but want to try to jump into this space. What advice would you give to a new entrepreneur who's who's ready to leave corporate America and go do their thing? I, I, that's a great question. So first of all, if, if you're leaving your job to start something on your own, good job. But my first advice is 
don't leave that paycheck until you have another paycheck coming in. That's my first suggestion. Because if you just get up and leave and then you try something new and it's on your own or with a buddy of yours who's doing a startup and you don't get money for a year, that's a problem, okay? And I'm sure any wife, spouse, partner would say the same thing to that person. Number two, um, if you're going to create a new product, do your market research and really see, is there an audience for it? Who do you want it to be for? And is it just a passion item or is it something that's actually needed and wanted? Silicon Valley has a motto. Listen, we want something that people don't know that they need or want yet and that can be used by millions. That's what VCs like to invest in. They want to know that someone's going to create an app that's actually going to give them NyQuil when they're almost sick, when they don't even know they're sick. OK, some, I'm just giving a, an example there that's crazy, but that's the key. And then the third is once you do your research, market research, you know, I live in L.A., so I have a lot of friends that make movies and, you know, create, try to create a movie. And I always say to them, hey, so you're making this movie. That's great. Who are you going to sell it to? Mm. I don't know. That, that, so it's the same thing with someone who makes a product. They're, they make a coffee cup with a clock on it. You go, well, who's your buyer? I don't know. I'll get to that when I get there. No, you got to think of that at the beginning. So you got to really lay it out. And just see who is your audience for that product. And will that audience, is that audience in millions or five people? You get it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, you got to have a market. Well, let me let me ask you this, because uh, I was literally scrolling through TikTok before I jumped on. And Vanilla Ice was talking about how the 90s were the greatest decade for for the, the culture, right? We had the greatest clothes and the you know, neon colors, whatever, whatever. But nostalgia always plays a big role. And, you know, when you think about a product and it's, it's got that nostalgic feeling, you do have a market. How can I take advantage of nostalgia, but not buy a shitload of VHS tapes? <laughs> well, you know, a good example of that, even with Vanilla Ice, and I, I remember listening to his music. I'm more of an 80s guy, but like records, LPs, vinyls, they have three different names. That is coming back and it's coming back strong and it's ironic and it's amazing how much it's coming back. And that is something that is is totally cyclic and came back because when records left in the late 80s, it was like they were done. And all the plants that made records, vinyl LPs, again, the other words, were all destroyed. So when records started coming back about 10 years ago, there was only one plant, one person that made them. Now there's like 10 or 15, 10 plants now doing it, I think. So it's amazing how that has come back. Even my daughter, who's 11, asked for a record player and got it for Christmas. She just thinks it's neat. So there, I think it almost has to do with just the generation and maybe just the growth of the human and just, I don't know, reincarnation or something. But things do come back. It is cyclic. I don't think VHS will ever come back. <laughs> yeah. Be kind, rewind, right? <laughs> Who remembers I, that one? <laughs> I like the VHS better than the DVD because... You could forward through the previews and the FBI warning on a VHS, where on a DVD, you cannot. You have to watch it. That's Most very DVDs, true. They don't let you do it, so you're like, what's up? And a DVD player has to, it has firmware, it has to update, where a VHS player, you just put it in, you hit play, you were done. <laughs> That's true. Well, now we can just stream it, right? Uh, fast yeah. forward that. I don't want to see that part. That is the, the streaming is easy. You can watch it from anywhere. I love it. But it's But that is a digital age and a digital item. You know, the, the the microphone you're working with, the mouse you use, the keyboard, that will never be digital. There are some things that can't be downloaded, as they say. That's absolutely true. Ryan, you have such an amazing story. You dropped such great knowledge with me today. I had fun on today's interview. Um, we are huge on video testimonials because uh, that's how, you know, we take advantage of word of mouth marketing. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, you've, I'm sure you've done a number of different podcasts. You're in the video, you're in the media space. So you're one of those unique individuals that I can ask, what was your experience like on the business bros podcast? It was great. Thank you. First of all, I love it because of the energy you have, by the way. So I think you and I have a certain harmonic that's right up there because I love the back and forth. We're quick and to the point, And I think that's great. And your, your energy is just, it just, it's keeping me there and alive where some, you know, sometimes I'm sure some guests have kind of gone off in different worlds. Sorry. Oh, about yeah. oh no, no, no. It, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Uh, it's funny because, you know, you, you talk about meeting different people and having different conversations. Not every guest is created equal. Uh, there are some days that I wake up and I don't have quite as many as I think I normally do. Yeah, you know, everything's a little bit different, but we show up every day. And, and, and you know, if, 
listening to your story, one of the things that I noticed is you never gave up, right? You, you consistently showed up. You may not have had all the answers. You may not have, you know, an exact direction where you're going, but you did have a North star. You knew what industry you were in and you kept persevering anyways. Um, when, what, what is the thing, my last question to you, what is the thing that when you wake up on those days that are off, which are most times that you don't feel like doing the things that you want to do, What's that motivating factor that keeps you going? Money. <laughs> um, not just money, just to have money in my wallet or pocket. But, you know, I when I was going to school, I was like, you know what? Not that I was raised poor or lived in a poor environment or anything like that. But it's like I always wanted my own money and be able to spend it when I want, where I want, how I want. I never wanted to have a restriction. So I just have a mentality. I'm just built. I'm coded. I have a special chip in my head where I was just like, okay. I wake up and I go, listen, I'm going to go make money today. It's going to be great. I want to make money to invest here or do this investment or buy this or buy that. And that's how I'm programmed. So when I wake up and it's a bad day, because, yes, we all wake up, we get out of bed. We're like, oh, OK, I need coffee today or whatever. I just go, <laughs> no, I'm going for the bigger game. I'm going to the office. I'm going to close this deal. I did my goals the night before. I walk in. I do it again. I re, you know, reaffirm myself. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do today? I look at my notes from the day before. Oh, I got to close that guy. OK, I got to close this. And I know ooh, if I close this. I get this, that's the payday. And that's the beauty of an entrepreneur or a salesman, because I am a salesman too, is we can make more money and do well and create our income as opposed to someone that's just making minimum wage. There's nothing wrong with, we appreciate, but there are certain carrots at the end of the tunnel that I go for. Preparation, ladies and gents, that's what's gonna get you there. Ziegler on selling his audiobook I've been reading lately and I love what he says. I mean, I am a salesperson. I will learn something today that'll make me a better sales professional tomorrow. Education's where it's at. Consistency is where you win. Ryan, thank you very much for coming on the show and taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, ladies and gents, that's it. It's the end of the weekend. Uh, Martin Luther King Day on Monday. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy your weekend. Stay safe out there. Um, drink some NyQuil. Put a mask on, do whatever you need to do, but enjoy the company of another human being, even if you have to do it digitally. Have a conversation with somebody. I promise you it's the best thing you could possibly do. Even if you don't agree, you'll be more empathetic to their situation. And you know what? Relationships are built that way. So go out and talk to somebody this weekend. Have a conversation. Ryan, thank you very much again for being a guest on the show. Thank cheers. You. Thank you. Yes, cheers. Thank you for listening to the Business Bros Podcast. Are you looking to get more clients or to increase your income? Hernan, the business bro, can help you generate referrals through the power of podcasting. And James, the insurance bro with Pipeline Insurance, can help you effectively add insurance to your existing business. If you are ready to create wealth today and generational wealth for tomorrow, email businessbros at csfirst.com to schedule a free consultation or join the Business Bros Network, www.businessbros.biz.